Hello, questions. That says hell questions. <laughs> yes, hell questions. <laughs> Just reminding you where you're all going. That's what we're here for. <laughs> So hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Your Queer Story. We're your hosts. I am the ever-talented Paul Hobbs. And I am the more talented Evan Jones. I love how we're constantly opening by just saying the same exact line, but one of us is saying that we're better than the other. Uh, that's because you copied me. That's not a doubt. No, yeah. it's not. It's because you spread lies and rumors. Did you see the Twitter poll? People like me the most. That Twitter poll is so old, you just need to run a fucking new one. First of all, that Twitter poll was only you answering it, and we already established that. There were two people that answered it. Now you need to ask people again. I now will. Now the folks are engaging more. Oh, I will. Okay, good. I hope you do. And I'll win again. So, <laughs> we just want to say thank you to our followers and listeners. Without your support, we couldn't do what we do. Really, mm. we couldn't. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, we could. We but. could, but not, it wouldn't be as, <laughs> as easy, and we already have a lot of issues that we have to deal with, so... Yeah. So, uh, we thank you uh, very, very much for that. Um, your support really does mean a lot to us. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to interact with us more, you can follow us individually on social media. You can find Evan on Instagram at EB and J Sandwich, mm -hmm. like peanut butter and jelly, but... With an EB and J. So it's like peanut butter and jelly. And uh, no, you can follow no, me, Paul, on Twitter at... At the Paul Hobbs. The Paul Hobbs, because there's no other Paul Hobbs. That's right. I'm <laughs> the Paul Hobbs. <laughs> the Paul Hobbs. <laughs> so, um, also, you can follow our social media accounts at Your Queer Story. Snap us. Snap us. We're developing our Snapchat more. Um, so, snap us. I uh, got some stuff on YouTube. If you go on there, not a lot, but we have been adding more videos steadily, slowly but surely. Um, and of course our Facebook and Twitter where we're most active and for exclusive access to even more material you can become a Patreon supporter for just $3 or more a month and your money goes strictly towards benefiting this podcast and helping the queer community uh, so for instance we've offered to help a local queer trainer um, give them some free training classes mm -hmm. through our support so they can give um, offer those free classes obviously to queer individuals who uh, struggle a lot. Um, if you're, especially if you're transgender, um, going to the gym can be hell. Uh, the gym is so important to me personally, but going there and trying to go to the locker room or working out, it's, it's just awful. So having a safe space is very important. So like we do stuff like that. We've also organized and funded meetups, contributed to local causes. We helped organize the Rhode Island Transgender Rights Rally in November and more. So just know that your money is going to a good cause. And that brings us to our next very important point. This month we are celebrating Black History Month by covering some of our favorite queer people of color. Um, we recognize that we are not the best people to be talking about the intersectional identities of being a queer person of color in America, especially during this time when racism has become more open and more blatant in the wake of the Trump administration. The best way to do this show would be to invite a queer black individual onto, our, onto the show to help us discuss these issues. However, space and lack of proper equipment greatly hinders our abilities to do this. It is the number one reason we are saving everything we can through our Patreon to upgrade our sound system and eventually establish an actual studio. So, although, again, we're not the best people to address Black History, we also felt it would be a dishonor to ignore this special month altogether and not give our listeners a chance to learn about these truly amazing stories. So, thank you for your patience and understanding. Know that we are working to include more guests and provide a wider perspective in the very near future. We love all our queer students and we want to make sure that every voice is heard and heard properly. So, thanks for being patient with us, guys. Um, again, we know we're two white guys talking about black history, but, um, good, do the best we can with what we can at this time. Exactly. So, so before we begin the hidden story of Mrs. Lucy Hicks Anderson, um, we have some questions. We're shaking it up a little bit this week and, um, asking ourselves two questions. First of all, who would be your celebrity BFF if you could choose anyone and they wouldn't run away from you screaming? I would have to pick Colleen Ballinger, also known as Miranda Sings, hey. just because she is one of the funniest people. Her like sense of humor, just like no matter what video it is, it always like knocks it out of the park. She cracks me up every time, and I think she's also a very good person. I follow her, Colleen Ballinger, as well. 
mm-hmm. um, you know, her personal page, and I feel like she's pretty genuine, so. Yeah. Seems like an overall good person. I think so. I actually would choose one of her good friends, Ariana Grande. Um, I would. Yeah. I know. You're jealous because you didn't think of that. No. I, but they could all still... hang out together. What? You would still... I would still pick Colleen. I would, I would do Ariana because I think that she has a very good sense of humor. And I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Like, I think she's down to earth. Obviously, she's an incredible singer. I love her music. But for me, it's more about the personality. Mm-hmm. And... Has nothing to do with anything. That's exactly. I don't care if you have an amazing voice. That's great. But if you have a shitty personality, I, I, I don't care. I don't care if you're an amazing actor, actress. If you have a shitty personality, I don't care. So, um, but she seems, I've seen her like, she's done um, like Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah. And, she's always real good. Exactly. She's, she's hilarious. She, I know, she, I can sense it. I don't so, think you two would get along. No? Why? No, I, th- I feel like it would be an awkward chemistry. Sorry, I'm just opening my drink. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's true. I don't think we have anything in common except for possibly our humor. I think we could get along in a room of people. Would we just like going out together? Probably not because I feel like she's a person that really enjoys shopping and I don't. Um, <laughs> that's the thing. She enjoys shopping. I don't. I think she, she just is, like has very feminine taste and I have very masculine taste. And so none of that would get along. But... Um, we could probably laugh over some things together. I loved her. Th- um, was it the Thank You Next video? What's the one that had the 90s theme? Did you watch that? I don't the- remember. Thank You Next had like the um, Mean Girls. Yeah, that's the 90s th- movies theme. That, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I love that. That's, that's brilliant. So, did you know Colleen Ballinger's in that? Yes, I did. Pregnant? I didn't know. I didn't know. And did you watch her video of her making fun of her? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh my god, Miranda's making fun of her in one of the videos. She's like, <laughs> you hired this fat girl to be on your show? And she's like, look. Like when they're doing the choreography yeah. on, the, on the field, she's like, mm-hmm. she like zooms in and she's like, she's not even doing the right choreography. She's literally not even on beat. Look at how ugly she is. The whole, <laughs> it's great. I love that she like just destroys herself. Yeah. Because that's how I am. That's good. <laughs> see, but see, can't... don't you think I could be friends with Colleen Ballinger? Yeah. Then I could be friends with Ariana Grande. Mm. That I could do. I could. I, all right? Just, just somebody send Ariana a little message. Just let her know <laughs> to check out our podcast. I'm sure, I'm sure one of her good friends is listening to this. Oh, yeah. Isn't her brother gay, though? Frankie Grande? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so maybe he's listening. I'm maybe. sure, definitely. Maybe. Tag Frankie Grande. <laughs> if you right. know Frankie Grande, just yeah, give him a little time to listen. Anyways. Uh, the other question was, um, if money was no object, what's one thing that you would buy? I would pay off my mom's house. I mean, I know that's not mm-hmm. like millions of dollars, but I would do that. Yeah. That would definitely be like, well, my grandma, like my family's houses, basically. Yeah. Just pay off those. Yeah. That's true. I would, I mean, I would probably do that too. I would buy a house. Yeah. If it was like for me personally, like if I was like to spend the money on myself, Uh yeah, I'd probably just buy like the most insane computer, like crazy, crazy, like computer, the whole chair, like a whole setup. Yeah. Yeah. Like the whole. (laughs) That's what I would do. I would probably have like chest surgery from like the best surgeon in the world. Like, go there, like, don't have to worry, because, I mean, most, like, a lot of surgeons have become more knowledgeable, but you still will see guys that get, a, like, a surgery, and it's, like, fucked up. Yeah. And it's, like, oh, God. You're stuck with you that, know? like, that's your life. And that's like, it, that's, that's it. it. You, there's no more yeah. to, like, fuck and with. Those, like... This fucking, like, even with insurance, it's usually about eight to $10,000 yeah. that you're spending out of pocket for that, and if they fuck it up... That's it. You still gotta pay. That's Are it. You, gonna... you still gotta pay. So, Damn. yeah, I'd get, like, a sh- uh, real good chest surgery. That's pretty good, yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. I think it's sad that we're so realistic about uh, what we would do if money was no object. Like, we're very realistic. <laughs> other people are like, I'm going to buy a fucking island, throw the big world's biggest rager. We're like, I don't know, maybe pay off some bills. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's the truth, though. That's it's true. What... <laughs> That's being a fucking adult, motherfuckers. Okay? You could throw that party, but you're still going to have your bills the next day. <laughs> All right? And you're not going to buy any friends with that. They don't care about no. you. Once the money's gone, so are they. Yeah, exactly. So spend it on something responsible. Well, anyways. All right. So, um, yeah. So those are some questions. Mixing it up a little bit. Taking a break from our what'd you do this week. 
But now, children, let us take you to the small town of Waddy. Maybe it's Waddy, W-A-D-D-Y, Kentucky. It's Kentucky. It's probably just Waddy. It's I probably doubt they just put Waddy. in like anything. It's Waddy, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Located just one mile off of I-64 in the northwest corner of the Bluegrass State. Lucy was born in 1886 to the Lawson family and assigned male at birth. However, as a toddler, Lucy began to refer to herself as a girl, so much so that her mother finally took her to the doctor to find out what was wrong with her child. Surprisingly, this doctor, in the late 1880s, just a few decades after the end of the Civil War, instructed Mrs. Lawson to allow her child to live as a girl. The family took the doctor's advice and renamed their new daughter, Lucy. Which, shout out to that doctor, yeah, because right? in that time, in that time, in that area, could you imagine, like, oh, no. openly, like, saying, yeah, let your daughter live as a woman. Let her live like, as a woman. Like, I don't know if, like, so, I mean, there's, okay, so the thing about Lucy Hicks Anderson, or Lucy Anderson, I, we'll get to like, why she has two, so many last names, but um, the thing about her is there's, w- the only thing we know about her life is pieced together from newspaper articles. Right. Like, it's not like we have a biography or anything, this is news articles piecing together this story, mm-hmm. and so I got conflicting stories, so one person said that, like, at age two, this happened, and her mother took her to the doctor, and another person said it wasn't until she started to enroll in school and she insisted on wearing dresses so like it could have been that up until this point her mother was kind of indulging her fantasies mm-hmm. and like okay well when she's older and she's around other boys then maybe she won't want to wear these dresses and lucy's right. like no bitch i told you i'm a girl and i'm wearing these dresses and so the doctor could have been like well it's just going to be easier on her she's insisting on that she's a girl mm-hmm. so it's just going to be easier on her if you let her dress the way she mm-hmm. wants and live the way she wants i don't know but hey kudos to you doc yep so Lucy was enrolled in school, and if the teachers had any problems with the young girl, there was no mention. Everyone in her life seemed to accept her for who she was, and eventually her sex at birth was forgotten. Lucy Lawson was a confident, hard-working young woman. At age 15, she left school to become a domestic worker. This was the most common trade for young black women at the turn of the century and well through the mid-1900s. Because of their race and thereby station in life, few other options were afforded. So, domestic jobs required long and often brutal hours with little to no actual compensation. <clears throat> the Oxford Encyclopedia de- defined the job as domestic work was, until 1940, the largest category of women's paid labor. Despite the number of women who performed domestic labor of four pay, the wages and working conditions were often poor. Workers labored long hours for low pay and were largely left out of the state labor regulations. The Association of Domestic Work with Women's Traditional Household Labor, defined as labor of love rather than as real work, and its centrality to Southern slavery had contributed to its low status. As a result, domestic work has long been structured by class, racial, and gendered hierarchy. So, um, I mean, I'll, like, this is kind of goes back, and I, I know there's a lot of kind of like mixed reviews on the show The Help mm-hmm. that came out several years ago. It's where Oh, what's her name? A couple of stars had breakout stars, but the woman from uh, from How to Get Away with Murder, like she's like a great star, and I can't think of her name. But anyway, so the help was like like it was about ten years ago now, actually, mm-hmm. and it talks about um, it it talks about like you know uh, the female workers in the, domestic workers in the houses and the poor conditions, and that was in the '60s. So you can imagine Lucy is doing this job in the turn of the century, 1900s. Right. You know. She's not getting anything. It's awful. So one white female news journalist went undercover to expose the hardships of the job. The Chicago and en- Chicago, <laughs> Chicago, the Chicago Encyclopedia wrote that she reported t- tolling fifteen hours daily and performing every household chore except laundry, which was sent out. She made two seventy five per week plus room and board. Which how much was this at that time? Um, that was less than the average. I don't know what the average was, but, um, the average paycheck was about $4 an hour and mm-hmm. she was making two seventy five. I don't know how that relates to today's cash. That's one of the figures I didn't work out, but she worked 15 hours a day doing Jesus. household chores. Constantly so you literally, on call. yeah, you literally just work. Yeah. I mean, 15 hours you're awake, what, like 18 hours a day? Yeah. So your whole day you're working. Exactly. Your entire day you're working, you just wake up and you work. And I don't know how someone has that many fucking household chores to do. Uh, yeah, literally... 
Yeah. What? What's your house? I mean, at that point, are you just like, mm, doesn't look that clean to me? That's literally what it is. It has to be what it is. You just want people constantly at your beck and call, mm -hmm. and like they're standing there, and like whatever you want, you want a glass of water, you want the drapes open. That's why you see in films they're like, Mildred, open the drapes, and Mildred's in the back as if fucking Margaret can't get off her goddamn mask and open <laughs> her own fucking drapes. Yeah. But Mildred's right. got to work fifteen hours a day, so you don't have to get off your ass, Margaret. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, those were the conditions of a white woman in the domestic work industry. Mm -hmm. While black women made up only 4% of the female work population in 1900, over 30% of domestic jobs were held by African Americans. As more opportunities opened for white women in the workforce, more black women stepped in to take the only jobs afforded them. So, of course, white women started being able to uh, take jobs as secretaries mm -hmm. and, and work in retail shops and... Of course, black right. women still are only allowed this one job. And the farther south you went, the less money a domestic worker earned. Most women in the south took three weeks to earn one week's worth of pay of a domestic worker in Chicago. The Chicago Encyclopedia also wrote of the frantic need for jobs within the black community. While a step up economically from the South, Chicago nonetheless presented newly arrived African American domestic workers with difficult conditions. As late as the 1930s, domestic servants complained of employers offering day work to the lowest bidder at the notorious slave pens at the corner of the Halstead and 12th Streets. While single white women often utilized domestic work as a temporary stop on a track of upward mobility, most African American women were forced to make careers out of domestic day workers or laundresses. Yeah, and this is not that long ago, people. No, it's not. It is basically I'm, slavery with a small yeah. sum of cash at the end of the week. It is. That's it's the only difference. Yeah, it really is. Because it's like, we're not going to let you work any other jobs. You have to have money so you can live. So we're going to force you to work these menial jobs. And we're jobs. also not going to give you any compensation, even though we as a country just held you hostage for oh, yeah, yeah, no, all no, these no, years no, and no. forced you to work. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? We did it. Yeah, we did it. Of course, <laughs> we, we came over here when our forefathers came over here. They gave us free land and they gave us a free start and they basically incentivized us to come over and here and start an over. And they entire population of <laughs> and people. And they killed everybody that was here and stole all their possessions. But you who were brought over here in slavery and who were given absolutely nothing and thrown out into the uh and thrown out into the streets and then forced to take jobs uh, the few jobs that we would offer you and you have to pay take whatever pay we give you right because mm -hmm. we're not going to just pay you what you deserve we're going to pay you the least amount that we can right but, and make you work as much as possible exactly and this is going to be a job for only people of color mm -hmm. um but but we, we don't have slaves anymore but we, we, we don't have that. slaves it's totally different that. and if you would just work harder that then you would pull yourself out of your mess and this is all set with sarcasm um so <laughs> what was it that because we just had um it was just a few weeks ago we saw we celebrated you know martin luther king jr day and we're talking to, and he was talking to someone about you know the concept of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mm -hmm. and like Yes, I, he's like, I understand America is a country that says pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, but that's kind of cruel to go to someone who doesn't have boots and tell them to pull themselves yeah, up by their own bootstraps. They literally don't have anything. <laughs> right. They so, don't have anything. Yeah. And again, these were the conditions of the North and not the conditions of Kentucky where Lucy worked to earn a living. Yet for the next five years, Lucy worked hard to earn enough money to move to Picos? Pecos? P-E-C-O-S, Texas where she worked at a hotel for the next 10 years. Then in 1920, at age 34, Lucy met and fell in love with Clarence Hicks. Little is known about the two's relationship, but the same year they ended up in Silver City, New Mexico, where they wed before heading to California. Hmm. Hey Christians, do you own a business? Are you an author or an entertainer? And would you like a great way to grow your audience? Well, this commercial slot could be yours. For just $20 a month, we can advertise your show on our podcast. And as a rapidly growing queer content source, we want to help get your name out there. So if you want even more promotion, you can just choose our $30 tier to get ads and links on our website. And for only $40 a month, we'll review your product on our YouTube channel and link it to all of our social media. So go ahead, send an email to your queer story at gmail today or reach out to us on social media via messenger and let us make your business a little more queer bye. bye i don't know how she ended up in silver city but she did i don't know if she followed clarence there if he like passed her on his way through her hotel nobody knows 
She just met Clarence, headed off to New Mexico, and then it was like, ah, eh, fuck it, let's go to California. So settling down in the town of Oxnard, Lucy went back to domestic work, but scraped every penny she could into her savings. A few years later, she bought her own property and opened a brothel selling illegal sex and illegal l- liquor during the Prohibition era. Perhaps it was her line of work. Perhaps it was Clarence's insecurities that his wife was a businesswoman. Or perhaps it was simply that the relationship had run its course. Either way, Clarence and Lucy divorced in 1929 after nearly a decade of marriage. You know what? Shit happens. Yeah, shit happens. It could have been anything. It could have been all those things. It could have been nothing. It could have been that they were just tired of each other. But I do love that she goes there and she, like, saves her money and she opens her own business and call it whatever. Like, she fucking opened that thing. That's incredible. It It is. That's that she incredible. was able to buy property for I of can't all. even any woman buying property at that time was oh, incredibly yeah. hard. And the fact that she was able to save up that much money working that job, I can't even save up enough money to buy like a computer because I spent it all on everything. <laughs> I know, so right? like like <laughs> her gotta... willpower alone is like to save that money. And women didn't even have the right to their own property until I could be wrong about this, but I want to say they didn't even have the right to buy their own property until 1919 when they got the right to, to vote. Again, I could so be she wrong. Fought. But she fucking got that shit. So Lucy poured herself full time into her business. Yes, businesses, because not only did Lucy turn her one brothel into several thriving brothels, she was also one of the best cooks and party planners in town. Her business savvy and strong social skills soon put Lucy as a regular contact with the town's elite. Whether she was catering an elaborate going away party for a prominent family son, or writing a commentary in the local newspaper, Lucy Hicks was a well revered member of Oxnard society. Yeah, kicking ass, taking names. Some even considered her indispensable. One night, after being locked up for running a brothel, which I'm sure was a regular thing, oh yeah, Lucy was bailed out by Charles Donlin. Charles was the town's leading baker and absolutely needed Lucy available to cater his party that evening. In addition to running her businesses, Lucy also volunteered for the Red Cross, made regular donations to the Boy Scouts of America, as well as many other local charities, And it was apparent that she had created quite a nest egg for herself because it was later discovered that she had invested over $50,000 in war bonds, which would equal approximately $729,000 today, nearly three quarters of a million dollars. Holy fuck. (laughs) She she must not spend money on anything. She must not. Those brothels were working because the people of Oxner needed to fucking get off. Apparently. Also, she was. They they couldn't say enough about the fact that she was a great chef. Like, she really people just loved her like she could you know she's cooking for well, you think about the it day. she's from kentucky she had that good southern oh cooking. yeah and then she, she can't just to, get anywhere then she yeah. moved to like where did she go to uh Oxnard, new mexico and california is where she's at now yeah but she moved yeah. like all over i'm sure she could learn oh yeah you know? went to texas probably learned how to pick up some like good <laughs> well, mexican you, yeah. food and if you think about yeah. it she worked as a I don't know what it's called. Basically, a slave all that time. I'm sure she cooked. <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah. She, know, well, she so did she, some domestic housework, and she which probably is just got a attacked if she didn't cook the food good. I mean, yeah. I'm sure she, you know it was like an like, what the fuck is this shit all the time? I think well, she. I think and also it's a pride in her just obviously being a good business. Well, woman. yeah, on top of it all, yeah, she's like she's she's researching recipes, trying, doing the best she can because that's how she's gonna you know sell her business. Right. That's how she's gonna earn a better place in whatever job she has. So. Uh, yeah, but by, by 19, this is, this is around, by the time this happens, this is around early 1940s. This woman has uh, three quarters of a million dollars set aside in her savings. Props um, her. Yeah. For 25 years, Lucy Hicks built a life in Oxnard, California. Respected and loved by everyone, no matter their race or status. At 58 years old, love found Lucy once again, and she remarried in June of 1944, this time to soldier Reuben Anderson. It seemed as though this small town girl, who had every odd and obstacle stacked against her, would finally settle down into a quiet and comfortable retirement. But sadly, fate would rob this well-earned reward from Mrs. Anderson. So on October 26, 1945, the San Bernardino Sun reported the following story, and we want to post trigger warning. There's a trigger. So be careful if you listen. This article is full of inaccuracies and offensive language. There are no racial slurs. We wouldn't read those, but there are none. But there is incredible transphobia. The article read, Employed as a maid in Ventura County, homes for the years. 
Employed as a maid in Ventura County Homes for years, a 43-year-old man was arrested on a charge for failure to register for the draft. Richard B. Hood, FBI agent here, said the man, known only as Lucy Hicks Anderson, was arrested on a raid in a ruin house in Oxnard and his sex was discovered. Hood said Anderson, recently retired from employment as a maid to operate the rooming house, married a soldier named Reuben Anderson and collected his allotment checks. <laughs> a man known only as Lucy Hicks Anderson, but okay, fuckhead. That was it. That was the story that shattered Lucy's life. She was put on trial for perjury and defrauding the American government by, Vin by Ventura County. The trial lasted over a week and was brutal. The woman had created the, the woman who had catered the elite's parties, who had welcomed them into her brothels to buy illegal alcohol and cheat on their wives with sex workers without any judgment. This woman who had sang in church and donated to the Red Cross and been active in her community for 25 years was now reduced to a joke. A laughing stock and an amusement for her townsmen and her country, which the, <laughs> I I wanted to read that before we like commented on it. Yeah. And oh it's yeah. Yeah. So infuriating. It is. Right. It's the most hypocritical thing. I can't believe for twenty five years she's there. She like you the fucking banker bails her out of jail so she can cater his party. She lets all these men into her into her brothel to mm. cheat on their wives. Yeah, to break the law by buying their liquor and God knows what else. Drugs, gambling, all the shit that was illegal. She's you know, she has no judgment. She's active, she's donating to the local community local charities. Like she like even though she has all this wealth, she's giving it back. Mm -hmm. And then the people of the town just turn on her and like, oh God, well, we didn't know. Oh, fuck you. These, yeah, it's disgusting. It's disgusting because again, it's not like she's some outsider that's been in the town for a year or two. For 25 years, you've known this woman and suddenly- She's worked with you. She's, she knows your children. She probably helped raise your fucking children. Exactly. She held your babies. Like, yeah. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, well, I'm better than you now. Well, yeah. Actually, I've always been better than you. I was just pretending. Right. Well, that's the truth, right? Because that's the thing. You always thought you were better than her. It, it's, it's infuriating. It's disgusting. It, so, during the trial, Lucy was forced to strip off her shirt and bare her chest to the jury. She was questioned on her wigs, her clothing, her mannerisms. Lucy, def Lucy defiantly said to the prosecution, I defy any doctor in the world to prove that I am not a woman. I have lived, dressed, acted just what I am, a woman. The prosecution took her up on her challenge and five different doctors stood and five different doctors took the stand to testify that Lucy was definitely a man. The defense countered with an argument that Lucy had hidden internal organs which would prove she was a woman but could not be produced until an op autopsy at her death, which is if you're just trans person like I can't imagine sitting there and having five doctors get up and just tell you what you know to be true like what you know, to defy what you know to be true. Right, like just, to defy, yeah. It's just the humiliation of it. It's the humiliation of the imagine. whole process. And that's what they. That's what it really was about. You could say it's about defrauding the government, but it's about to humiliate the government. Defrauding woman. the government how? For what? Oh, because she lied to him. Say that she dodged the draft and uh, she, t she collected her husband's uh, pension from the fucking military. Better. So in a desperate attempt, to the de in a desperate attempt, the defense offered up Lucy's body upon her death for medical examination. Author C. Riley Snorton, who wrote our main source for this episode, Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity, said of this bargain, In exchange for an unincarcerated life, Hicks Anderson's hidden organs defense offered up her corpse to be put to indefinite institutional use, indexing the medical industry's sustained practice of experiments indexing the medical industry's sustained practice of experimentation on black bodies. Though Hicks Anderson's defense comp compri though Hicks Anderson's defense comprised a critique of medical wisdom as a science of the surface, it also highlighted how black fe how black flesh had long been central to medical professional knowledge. Yeah, so Snorton was just saying that, like, once again, um, you know, because if you know your history, you know that um, it's atrocious the way that that slaves and, and um, African-Americans, even after slavery ended, were experimented on. And uh, and again, it was just an insult to injury. Even though Lucy would be dead, her, her body being subjected to that experimentation mm -hmm. of like, oh, well, we want to see what's wrong with you. And again, just you just like as if the, you know, the African-American doesn't matter how right. we, what we do with your body after you're dead, how we experiment on it doesn't matter because... You know, it's just more, as Snorton said, more black flesh to experiment on. 
So Lucy Hicks Anderson was convicted of perjury, but a judge was merciful and placed her on 10 years probation rather than forcing her to serve time. Yet her nightmare had just begun. The story spread across the nation and was finally picked up by major publication Time magazine. In the article, Time lays out a beautiful story of Lucy's life before suddenly flipping the narrative to make Lucy the butt of a joke. The editor later followed up with the story by publishing letters written in about Lucy's story and the many suggestions to make her Time's Man of the Year. They then updated their story to add that the U.S. Army was now going after Lucy for failing to register for the draft, and next to her story, they included an illustration of a bearded figure in a dress. <clears throat> Lucy was indeed in trouble with the military, and she and Reuben were, were both placed on trial for defrauding the government with their so-called fake marriage. During the trial, Lucy refused to answer whether or not she had male genitalia and refused to lie and say that she was a man. The Washington Evening Star ran a headline on June 8, 1946, which read, FBI charges mock wedding of two men to get allotment. Lucy had lived as a woman her entire life and now had, ident and now had her identity further insulted as the government insisted this was just a ploy to get money. And how much money? $1,000, worth about $12,000 today. Yeah. So she's like, uh, that's pennies. You wanna, yeah, right? Uh, you wanna, yeah, no, like, no. I got a fucking three quarters of a million dollars just in war bonds, bitch. Like, right. I'll give you your thousand dollars. And um, it's funny, not funny, but, uh, you know, it, with the transgender military ban that went into effect a few weeks ago, um, a lot of the argument, one guy was arguing with me and talking about how uh, transgender soldiers just want to enlist so that they can get money and get their surgery covered. And another person's like, I'm pretty sure there's a lot easier ways to get your surgery and to get funding than to risk your life on the fucking battlefield. But that's always the case. You just want this so that you can have attention and so that you can have money. I'm even though it makes no fucking sense. <laughs> even though it's a lie. Even though you've lived your entire life this way. Even though you're putting yourself in peril and you're having to go through unnecessary, not unnecessary, but these extra hardships. Sure, it's all and about the mental money. trauma. And the mental trauma, the abuse, all of it. But sure, yeah, it's so I can get some extra money. Lucy and Reuben were both sentenced to prison. Lucy was forced to house with the male prisoners, denied women's clothing, and any consideration of her female identity. Upon their release, they tried to go back to Oxnard. However, the local sheriff advised them that it would not be safe for the couple to return to their home. Instead, Reuben and Lucy settled down in Los Angeles, where they remained until Lucy's death in 1954. She was 68 years old. And a very interesting comparison has been made uh, by Snorton between Lucy's case and that of Christine Jorgensen. Jorgensen is known as the first transgender celebrity in America and one of the first publicly out trans individuals in our country's history. Truthfully, there were many trans figures who lived life openly before Jorgensen, but many were not afforded the opportunity many were not afforded the opportunities that she received. On December 1, 1952, just 7 years after the trial and public ridicule of Lucy Anderson, the New York Daily News ran a front page story that read XGI becomes blonde beauty. I wonder why. I wonder <laughs> right? what the difference was. Well, God, I can't, I can't quite put my finger on what's different about this story. How interesting that the white Danish blonde woman who dressed in pearls and fit the Jude Cleaver look of the day became a national sensation, while the hard-working black woman who, net, who invested in her community, built her own empire, lived her identity a authentically was reduced to jokes and taunts snorton and other historians such as emily skidmore she wrote emily skidmore wrote true sex which uh, talks a lot about transgender men in america both theorized it was white freedom at play during the cold war that allowed christine to live openly whereas others did not have this op opportunity snorton quotes serlin in his book writing Freedom was, and still is, malleable enough in its time to appeal to religious zealots, civil rights activists, political ideology, political ideologies, and aspiring transsexuals alike. So, um, basically what they were saying uh, is that, <clears throat> so there, so you have to see, think of America in this context, you know, this is 1952. Red scares hit. We've defeated Nazis and fascism in um, World War II. Mm -hmm. We're facing our new enemy of the communist Russia and, and communist China. And there's this big ploy about freedom 
in America and how individuals, we, we value our, indi unlike the communists, we value the individual's freedom. Now they can, they had a whole separate, um, you know, idea about homosexuality, mm -hmm. right? Homosexuals were pedophile. They had, they spent decades creating that narrative and now they could sell it. But there wasn't enough about the transgender and transsexual individual to know, um, to really have a bigoted stance on it yet. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people had to say that Christine Jorgensen should have this right and this freedom to transition to a woman if she wanted. it. Um, but it, then it shows on the other side how someone like... Uh, Lucy Anderson, who's a black woman, how she's viewed more as an object oh, yeah. than she is as a, a person. Whereas Christine Jorgensen can transition because she's an American who deserves freedom. It shows that Lucy Anderson isn't seen as an American. It's like the start of nationalism. Right. It, well, that's it, that's exactly what it is. World War II is really the, the uprising, at least, of nationalism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so which, Snor which Norton then added... Yet if Jorgensen's media figuration came to represent a form of freedom, it also signified upon the various kinds of unfreedom that marked and continue to mark black and trans communities. As the country rode the wave of the Red Scare and our defeat of, the, of Nazism and fascism, as we faced our new enemy of communism, many were able to digest the image of Christine Jorgensen because she followed the rules. She was straight, she was domesticated, she was feminine, and most importantly, she was white and she was beautiful and blonde. Yes. Since she oozed sex and was always portrayed in that way, she could be forgiven for her transgressions. However, Lucy Hicks Anderson's refusal or inability to conform to traditional standards due in large part to her race and her transgender identity was not afforded the same liberties as her sister, Christine. You know, she doesn't have, like, it, even if she wanted to, who knows if she would have wanted to? Like, mm -hmm. she, you know, who knows if she would have, would have wanted to pander to this? I'm a nice little housewife, stays at home. I don't home. think she would have. She would have been like, fuck you, I built my fucking empire. Exactly. So this, like I said, this woman's been out kicking ass since forever. But even if she had wanted to, she wouldn't have been able to. Right. She had, doesn't have the same. Lucy was held to a different standard and viewed more as an object that didn't fit its intended place. We saw the same double standards and indignities shown towards Marsha P. Johnson in our coverage of our fourth episode. It is simply impossible to compare the experiences of a white transgender woman to a transgender woman of color. While there may be similarities, and while we can all garner strength and inspiration from Lucy's story, we must point out the lopsided playing field that transgender people of color and all people of color face. And that's our episode for today, everyone. Your recommended resource is Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of, a Racial History of Trans Identity by C. Riley Snorton. And we will be back next week with a much more current figure, RuPaul. So make sure you tune in for that queerness. And in the meantime, make sure, again, that you check out our social media. Snap us. Snap us. Snap us at your queer story. You can also join us on Patreon, and we would really, really, really appreciate having you on board. That's right. Again, all your support goes back into the podcast, us getting better equipment, and being able to do more things with the podcast. Yep. But most importantly, don't get a lobotomy. And stay queer. We love you, our cycling sapphists. And our beautiful allied hookers. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>